Here we go. Hello, welcome to today's lesson. We're going to be looking at some types of training today from the physical training and peak performance and optimal performance units of the course. Uh, in particular, we are going to be going through, uh, I believe it's seven uh, separate types of training, and we're going to look at what they are and the different characteristics and attributes of each training method. And we're also going to be looking at some advantages and disadvantages. Now, for today, we're not going to be worrying too much about uh, evaluating each training method for different sporting scenarios or different sports performers. Uh, that that's what we'll do in, in a separate group class. So today we'll just be looking at the characteristics of training methods and the pros and cons of each. So the learning objectives, which you will be hitting today, I hope, um, all of you will know the characteristics of different types of training. And then most of us should understand the advantages and disadvantages which the performers and the coaches will have to consider and weigh up when designing their training plan. So to kick it off, we are going to look at circuit training. Now circuit training, as you can see from the, uh, the picture just there on the, on the right hand side of the screen, is this idea of completing multiple exercises in a series of rounds. So if we were to complete a single round, then we have done one circuit, but you know, typically circuit training is you know, a selection of exercises which we repeat multiple times. So one after the other, and we go around that circuit multiple times. And the main considerations here are what, well, what stations are we going to include, how long do we spend on each station, and how long do we spend in between each station. So when the performer is designing their sequence, they need to be thinking about what they're trying to achieve. Now, what sport or activity are they training for? Do the activities that they've selected mimic the sport in any way or do they develop the components of fitness that they'll end up requiring? If not, then perhaps they need to rethink their design. If so, fantastic, they can start completing some of these circuit training sessions. Now, we have mentioned there about the, the rest, or sorry, we or definitely mentioned about the goals there, whether or not it matches up with the person's sport, but we also need to work out how much resting time and working time we're spending on on each station and in between each station because well, playing around with those can determine the intensity at which the person is training and if the person is a you know, high intensity sports performer then they'll want to be working to or close to or at least towards their maximum levels to hit those anaerobic anaerobic intensities but then they'll also need to build in appropriate rest time so longer periods so that their body can fully recover so that next station they can hit it close to their 90, 95 or maybe even their 100% capacity. Uh, the, the second one on the list there is the equipment. Now circuit training which we'll cover now, um, some, some, some really good things with it is that it doesn't have to require equipment. There's a lot of body weight exercises and simple movement actions which don't necessarily need equipment to be, to be effective. So it can be a very cost effective and easy to set up, quick to set up you know, method of training. But if the performer has specific needs due to their sport, their goals, then they might need to be you know, pre-planning each of their circuits so that they do turn up with the right equipment at the right time, with the right levels of resistance so that their circuit hits their training plan and their, and their far off goals. Uh, and then obviously the number of rounds, which we've already spoken about at the start there. Typically a circuit has two or three, but you know, it's up to the performer. You know, the more activity stations there are, the less rounds we're probably going to be able to fit in before the 30, 40, 50 minute mark starts to come up. If the person wants to overload a certain movement action and they only do three or four different movement actions, then they might have to complete six or seven rounds to actually you know, to, to fill the 30, 40, 50 minute time period that, 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 well, that they'll probably be aiming for. So some pros versus cons. Some positives is that it's easy to make it specific. It's easy to take those performance goals, to look at the type of sport or the type of activity they're preparing for, and then almost and just, just elicit movement actions and skill stations which will help them in their competitive situation. So the picture there is of a football training drill where each of those stations is 
Now it's building on a skill or a movement or a component of fitness required for success in football. So it's very easy to make it specific. But in order to do that, what might start to come into play here is you know, the need to plan. So the coach or the performer, they'll be very heavily involved with writing out the circuit training session plans and following them rigorously. The more activities, the more stations, the more there is to set up, pack down and record. Because you know, any sort of training program needs to include some form of measurement or tracking to check progress. But if we've got lots of different stations, then we're going to have to come up with lots of methods to track progress in each of the stations. So it could be quite, not time heavy, uh, it could require a lot of time commitment to make it effective. If we're going for varied stations, lots of stations, and we're using equipment. But the positives, which you can still see on the left-hand side there, you know, there is technically, I'm just looking at the third one there, there's a limitless range almost. But we could, we could make so many different circuits for free. You know, straight away, just thinking of you know, body weight exercises off the cuff, sit-ups, press-ups, burpees, jumping jacks, side steps, squat jumps, frog jumps. There's so many different things that you can do and combining them in a different sequence each time. So there are some pros, there are some cons. Um, obviously the coach or the performer will need to consider both sides. So second method of training, second type of training we have is continuous training. Now as you can see from the pictures, we've got a variety of different contexts which are ideal for this training type. Cycling, running, rowing, walking, jogging, swimming, if I didn't already say that one. But we should be aiming for sort of this 20 to 30 minute window as a minimum. 20 to 30 minute window as a minimum. We mainly focus on the endurance aspects. So muscular endurance and aerobic endurance. Now I say that in such a way that you know, it's almost like a bad thing, which to some it is because if you require more components of fitness than just those two, then overuse of continuous training won't benefit you massively. Now, it's not going to be the most effective use of your time if there's other more important components of fitness for you to develop. Take, for example, a sprint cyclist. Now, they won't necessarily need continuous training or to be to be too um, what can we say too prevalent in their training regime because come performance they don't actually need to cycle for more than you know, one minute. So we need to weigh up the, again the pros and cons of continuous training, but the macro look of it, the, 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 broad, the broad approach to continuous training is this 20 to 30 minute window of 60 to 85 percent of our training intensity. So 60 to 85 percent, again training intensities we'll cover in a separate lesson, but 60 to 85 percent basically means if you were to sprint as hard as you can for as long as you can, that's your 100%. And that's going to push your heart rate and muscles to its maximum capacity. If you were to take it back a notch or two and arrive at our 60 to 85% capacity, for example, a jog or a brisk jog, that would be within this aerobic training zone. So we don't want to take it too easy, we don't want to take it too hard, we just need that sweet spot in the middle and we hold the movement there for 20 to 30 minutes. So some positives is that it could require very little kit, very little um, you know, knowledge or know-how or specialist equipment. We've got this person here in the picture, they've just gone for a run. Yes, they've got the, uh, the iPhone or the, or the iPod or the stereo system um, on their arm. They've probably got some, some branded sportswear and shoes as well. But in essence, we just need to get some shoes on and go out for a run. Obviously, the more specialised it becomes, the more expensive it becomes, the more committed we are to this training method. But at face value, it's so simple to complete. We're moving for 20 to 30 minutes. And the movement needs to be at a level that we can sustain at a constant rate for 20 to 30 minutes. Now, when we start to get into you know, cycling and rowing, yes, we might start to incur some more costs and require some more specialist knowledge. But if we just take walking and running, it's a very simple, fundamental motor skill which anyone and everyone can have access to. All we require as well to 
to sort of assess our you know, level of work, our progress against our, our current state, is a heart rate monitor. So a smartwatch or just a, just a heart, rate, heart rate monitor or a fit, uh, Fitbit perhaps, all you need to do is to have some form of record of your heart rate because that will tell you if you are in your 60 to 85% zone, if it's got a feature which can track your speed as well, you can start to match up the speed that you can get to while remaining inside your 60 to 85% intensity training zone. So it's very little equipment to actually plan and then monitor the, the, the completion of continuous training. Now some negatives are that it can be quite boring, quite repetitive, because if we do go out for a run, if we do go out for a cycle or a swim, and we have to do it for 20 to 30 minutes minimum, and we have to stay in a certain training intensity zone, well, it doesn't leave much scope for change or variation during the training session itself. You might be able to include different contexts each time that you complete continuous training, but when you're actually in it, it could be quite boring. And not only can it be boring, that repetitive nature, completing the same movement over and over again, could cause repetitive strain injuries, shoulder issues for swimmers, shin splints for runners, osteoarthritis for cyclists in their knees, constantly going up and down, flexing, extending, almost like pistons. And that last point down there as well. What about the performers who don't rely solely on muscular and cardiovascular endurance? What about those who need strength, power, agility? Continuous training doesn't really hit those. So what about, what about those athletes? Should they prioritize using continuous training or should they use their time in an alternative training method? Moving on, flexibility training. So our third type of training. And what you need to know is about static stretching. So static stretching where we hold the muscle at the end or the limit of its range in movement. So right now I'm standing up, my quadriceps are in a short position because my knee is extended. The quadriceps are short. So if, just like this person up at the top here, they were to pull the heel up towards their bum, suddenly we're stretching the quadriceps but to make it a static stretch, that position will need to be held for anywhere between 8 and 30 seconds. Less than this, and we start to move into a different form of stretching, also called dynamic or ballistic. Too much, or much more than 30 seconds, that can start to cause issues inside the muscle itself. Because it will start to almost, not set in those extended positions, but if we're at the limit of our range of movement, well, that's not the most comfortable place for our body to be. So we don't want to put undue stress on the joint by holding it at its maximum. Now, within static stretching, we have two different types. We have active and passive. Active basically means you're doing it. You're playing the active role in stretching your muscle. You're applying the forces. So it might be, if I were to do my quadricep stretch, my bicep and my trapezius, that is what's contributing and contracting to pull and create the stretch of my quadricep. Passive, on the other hand, is when your whole body is relaxed. You're not putting your limbs into a position that stretches your muscle. You could use a partner. You might use a wall, for example. So if I were you know, to stand like this, for example, and gradually move myself into the wall, well, technically, it's the position of the wall that's creating the stretch in my pectoral. So passive is the use of someone or something else to create the stretch. Active is it, it's, it's just us, just us creating the stretch. So some positives of not just static stretching, but flexibility training as a whole. That top one, sport specific. We can take sport scenarios of, of, of a performance activity and we, and we can look at you know, different movement actions or skills where you know, a better range of movement might be beneficial. So for example, in hockey, someone who's got better range of mo movement in their hips or lower back, in their hamstrings, they can get lower down towards the ground while maintaining a more upright position. 
so they can see more of the pitch and the opponents while being close to the ground, ready to block the ball. Second point, cheap and accessible. Now that person there, yes, they've got a mat underneath, and they don't need a mat. Right, there you go, I've, I've just done a stretch. Didn't require anything apart from a tiny bit of knowledge. Which sort of goes down to that last point there, really. It's, a, it's quite a simple way to reduce risk of injury. It doesn't require you know, any fancy equipment or you know, a change of rules or regulations. A person can train their flexibility to you know, train their body to be able to achieve a wider range of positions safely, comfortably. Now think about it in a contact sport such as, you know, such as rugby or American football where there might be some contact and that person's body is forcibly manipulated into a new shape. But if the muscles are used to being moved through a wider range of motion, then that impact won't you know, put undue strain or a stretch onto that muscle. So it can help prevent or it can lower that risk of injury. Negatives. It could be viewed as time consuming. Potentially not time consuming, but that second point more so, is it a waste of time? Is it, is it a less effective use of time? You know, for a, a strength athlete or a power athlete you know, who doesn't really require too much range of motion, for example, squats or Olympic lifting, could they be using their time in training better? Developing components of fitness that, that make a bigger impact on their overall success. And then that third one there. I said earlier how that you might need a little bit of know-how to do a quadriceps stretch, but when we start to get into more elaborate flexibility training, different forms of flexibility training, using resistance, perhaps we're using movement now, and it could be that you're, you're the partner helping someone stretch passively, but well, what if we get something wrong? And we do overstretch or strain a muscle. That injury could put this person, the performer, out of, out of action for the next week or so. So we do have to approach flexibility training sensibly. Weight training. So first of all, what is weight training? Well, it's when we are moving against gravity. We're lifting something up or we're overcoming a resistance, which typically is being held down by gravity. Now we do have the, the option of you know, resistance bands where it's, it's the elasticity of something which could be creating the resistance, but you know, largely it's to do with gravity. So as you can see from that picture, these people are lifting a mass upwards into the air which gravity is trying to pull back down. If we were to use a cable machine, okay, another type of resistance training or weight training, that cable, which might run through a pulley system, is connected to a block of weight or mass which gravity is putting down. Now the pulley systems are there to you know, help us you know, target different muscles and different movements because let's say we take the tricep push down, you might be thinking, well how is that working against gravity if I move my arms down towards the ground? Well because of the cable running through the pulley, which connects to the weight which is in the rack in front of me, as I push down, that weight is being lifted up against gravity. Now, I've put there in the sort of that, that non-bolded section, free weight training is different. I've just spoken there about cables and how we've got pulley systems and racks and the weights being moved up and down in you know, a certain direction. Free weight training is a little bit more dangerous, but also more beneficial. Why? Because it's multi-directional. These people here in this picture, yes, they're creating the movement of a shoulder press, but if they get alignment slightly wrong, which as they're lifting, they will, you know, even if it's just by a millimeter or two at a time, that slight forward or backwards motion of the weight is going to change the alignment of their body and their stabilizing muscles are going to have to engage while the main muscles causing the movement, their shoulders, their deltoids, they produce the main movement, but lots of others are getting involved and contracting and relaxing to help stabilize the body and keep it on course as that weight tries to fall and move in lots of directions at the same time. Now within weight training, we've got these well, two keywords, reps or repetitions 
and sets. Now, a repetition is one movement action. So, in this picture, as they go from shoulder, up, down. That's one complete movement action. We've got up, down. Okay, so if we were to look at it anatomically, we've got abduction, adduction. So we've got one complete movement action is one repetition. Now we can choose how many repetitions we string together in a row. That number, or however many we do choose to string together in a sequence, that's a set. So we've got a number of repetitions making up a set. Now we can decide, or we probably will decide if we're, if we're uh, weight training effectively, to do a multiple sets. So we could do three to five blocks or sets of 10 repetitions. So let's say we go maximum five sets of 10 reps in each, block of 10, rest, block of 10, rest, block of 10, rest, block of 10, rest, block of 10. 50 total repetitions split up into five separate sets. Now what can determine how we split up our movement, whether or not we use you know, low reps or high reps, few sets or many sets, well, that's determined by the intensity. And in order to determine intensity, we have to think, well, what am I trying to achieve through weight training? What is it about my sport or goal or activity choice? How do I have to perform in that? Do I need explosive strength? Do I need to be able to contract a muscle multiple times in a row without getting tired? Endurance. Or do I need to produce large movements over and over again as quickly as I can? Dynamic strength. Once we've got that information, we can start to manipulate what repetitions we choose to do, what sets we choose to do, how heavy we decide to lift. There's no right answer. Only right for what? So we can manipulate the intensity and it's based on our one rep max. That's what that means down at the bottom there. One RM, our one repetition max. So for these people in the picture, they would have a number where they could, with correct form and safe form, they could complete one repetition of that movement action. If they tried again, they'd fail. They'd be too tired. So that weight that they could lift one time, one repetition, that's their one rep max. So we can then start to decide what percentage of that we decide to move. And depending on that, will determine whether we do strength endurance, explosive power, or dynamic strength. So, some pros and cons of, uh, well, weight training. Before we get there, we are going to look at some, or three things that are so important to remember to, to include and to you know, ensure that is, is in your weight training program. First one is breathing. Whenever we are moving a weight around, it's important to keep that breathing going, that rhythm going. If you hold your breath, blood pressure can spike, O2 levels can drop, CO2 levels can spike, and someone can start to go a little bit lightheaded. Blood vessels can rupture because of too much blood pressure. Body alignment, all of our joints, you know, they're, they're so fluid. Any, any sort of movement or shape that we, that we produce, there's going to be different forces at play because gravity is pulling through the body. Now, if we were to add a weight on top of that, go back to that picture there with the shoulder press, if that person were to let that weight move forward a little bit, suddenly this whole shoulder joint is being pulled and rotated while we're trying to move it in a way that it's not meant to move. If we've got to think back to our, our skeletal functions, where we've got joint actions that occur, the joint structure, the bone shape, the tendons, the ligaments, everything that's at play in a joint does, is designed in a way that moves it in a set way. Elbow flexes and extends. So if, for example, I was doing a tricep extension over my head, and as I'm lifting the weight up, it starts to fall out towards the side, and it pulls and rotates my elbow and I'm still trying to flex and extend it, suddenly that multi-directional benefit that we spoke about earlier, that, well, that's now working against me. 
So it's so important to align your body to make sure that joints stay safe. So in a squat, for example, it's so important that knees don't go over our front toe. It's important our back stays straight, our chest stays forward. We don't go too far onto our toes. We apply force through our heels. If we can do that, then our skeleton and joints will stay safe. Third one there is a spotter. Now we've got a chap here probably going for quite a, quite a high, high weight, maybe even his personal best is one rep max. He's got one, two, three, potentially four. Uh, top right, you might be able to see someone else there, but definitely three people spotting his movement person behind him, he's there, in case this person starts to fall forward, the spotter can help bring him back up. The people on the sides, they're there to help add some extra force onto the weight on his way up or down, depending on if he gets fatigued early or late, but they, they're there to add some extra force to help with the, the, the line that the weight will move in. Because without those three people there, if something went wrong, that's a lot of weight coming down on that person, which could, well, could cause death. So, some pros and cons. I'm going to start with the bottom one. That ties in quite nicely with the picture. Because it's very numerical, we're using numbers, weights, reps, sets, intensities, percentages. It's very good to track. It's very easy to, not in real life, it's not easy to you know, progressively overload, but to plan overload, to plan progression. It's very easy to add a certain percent every few days or every few weeks, so it's easy to control. There's also a lot of different movement actions. So we can use different pieces of equipment at different weights, at different intensities, which can help with variation and it can avoid that tedium setting in. And that top one. We can make it specific, sport specific. We take the activity, common situations that occur in their sport. We take those actions, we look at the muscles that they're using and how they're using them, and we can design a training regime that challenges that muscle in a similar way. However, negatives, we've got a high risk of injury, huge risk of injury, especially if the performer is uneducated. If they don't know how to train properly, huge risk of injury. And unless you're going to a gym where you might be paying you know, a monthly fee, it's going to be very expensive to get yourself involved by buying your own equipment. So it's a very costly way to train. It's not as cheap as buying a pair of trainers once and then going out for continuous training time and time again. Now, weight training costs money because if we're moving weights and there's a high risk of injury, there's gonna be a lot of cost involved with making sure things are safe. Okay, next, we've, got, we've had continuous. We need to go back through them. What have we had so far? We've had circuit, that was our first one. We've had continuous, we've had flexibility, we've had weight training, now we have Plyometric training. So what is plyometric training? So from the, the picture itself, if we start there, it's a lot of jumping, hopping, bounding. Why? Well, it comes down to the points in this page here. And it's that one, two, three, four, fifth point down. That's the key thing that you need to remember from this, from this training method. It's an eccentric stretch or an eccentric contraction. Eccentric, concentric. Eccentric means elongate, where a muscle gets longer. Concentric means when a muscle gets shorter. So plyometric training is the combination of an eccentric stretch of a muscle followed rapidly by a concentric contraction. So if you think about hopping, or we'll say bound, or no, we'll go for it like a, like a box jump or a squat jump. So if you were to jump down from a box into a squat position, then your hamstrings are going to be stretching up towards your glutes. Your quadriceps on top are going to be stretching. Your gastric nemius in your calf is going to be stretching. So then when you decide to land and jump straight back up again, they've gone through two phases. Eccentric stretch as they've 
as they controlled your landing, followed by a concentric contraction as they coil up and shorten and propel you into the air, and they extend all of your limbs below. Now over time, this can train the muscle to contract faster and harder, because we can use the elastic property of the muscle, that stretch, rebound, stretch, rebound. So imagine if you had an elastic band and you held it ready to fire it, if you wanted to get a little bit further, you'd put it back a little bit first and then let it go. You stretch the muscle, then contract it concentrically. And then some examples down at the bottom. Bounding, bouncing, hopping, skipping, jump rope. Some pros. It's great for strength and power. Just a fantastic training method to develop jump height, speed, agility. It improves that responsiveness and the quickness of a muscle contraction. It can be cheap. Bounding, hopping, skipping, jump rope. We're working against gravity. And because of that, they're quite simple movements. Fundamental motor skills. Jumping, running, skipping, hopping, bounding. So if it doesn't take much equipment and it doesn't take much specialist knowledge, well, surely anyone can complete plyometric training without too much preparation. Similarly to weight training, we can, we can you know, build in reps, sets. It's very easy to manipulate, uh, manipulate the work time, the rest time, the intensity. Lots of positives. And that second point there, micro tears. That's what happens when we try and you know, create a bigger, stronger muscle. We break it down, so then we use protein to build it up again, stronger, we repair it. Some negatives, explosive movements, quick movements. We're talking about range of motion. We're taking limbs and muscles, stretching them, to then contract them forcibly. That's gonna cause, that's gonna cause the delayed onset of muscle soreness, or DOMS, as it's also called. And we just said a good thing is that we, we create micro tears in it, because if we tear it, we can repair it. But we still need to tear it, we still need to break it, and if we break the muscle too much, it could be too much to recover from, and we end up injured, and then that means time off training. And the last one there, bounding, hopping, jumping, to get these explosive movements, we're talking 90, 95, 100%, of our maximum capacity. That takes motivation, that takes focus, determination, to keep that person working at such a high intensity to, to elicit the, the benefits. If someone isn't that fussed, if someone's not that into it, are they gonna get much out of it if they don't fully commit to it? Because they won't be able to create the micro tears, they won't be moving fast enough to train their muscle to go from eccentric to concentric. Fartlek training. We've got fartlek training and we've got some interval training to look at still. Now fartlek comes from this Swedish word speed play. So just on that alone we know that it's going to be similar to continuous training in that we have to maintain a certain speed but we can play around with it which means the intensity is also going to be varied throughout. Now we don't want to work too hard at any one time because that will create the need for absolute rest. So we're almost bouncing between what we said earlier for continuous training was this 60 to 85% of your maximum capacity. Well, that will then stay constant. And that will stay at the same, perhaps 70% all the way through. The same speed, same heart rate. Well, for fartlek, we want to bounce between this bottom threshold and top threshold. Low to high, low to high, to moderate to high, to low. So we have this, this varied approach to training. It still needs to last between 20 and 30 minutes or more because we're still developing that aerobic capacity. And we can use heart rate monitors, just like with continuous training as well, to check that we are fluctuating between 60 and 85%. But it's not planned. or Not that it's not planned, it's, it's difficult to plan. Because the moment... The moment we start to get into 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, that's when we start to talk more about interval training, which we will shortly. 
So fart leg training is this mixture of continuous training, constant speed and intensity, and interval training where we have plan, work and rest periods. So fart leg, how do we achieve it? Well, it could be running, cycling, rowing, swimming. But as long as we can manipulate those three things, our speed of movement, our terrain, or the conditions that we're moving in, and the resistance that we're moving against. So do we, do we include hills on our cycle or run? If we're swimming, are we swimming in open water where waves or currents could change during our swim? The terrain, are we running on road, sand, a trail run through woodland? All of these things will alter how our body is working and contracting and moving inside of its environment. And if we can change the environment and how quickly we're moving through it, or well, we're going to change the demands we place on our body. And that's what's going to create this bounce, this wave between 60 and 85% of our training capacity. Some pros, well, it's varied. You know, it gets people out into different environments. Would you rather go for a 30 minute run on a treadmill where you've got a pre-planned you know, uh, speed, or would you rather go for a run in the countryside with a couple of hills? And you, and you run on a road, then you go in the woodland. So it's a little bit more varied. It's designed to keep things a little bit fresher, a bit more exciting. There's more ownership. That top one there. The performer chooses. They're choosing to go in different directions, choosing to go up hills, down hills. They choose to go faster for a little bit of time. And they might reward themselves with a little bit of a slower period. But some downsides, that top one requires self-discipline. Now what's stopping the person from seeing that hill coming up and they slow down intentionally? So that in fact they do just stay at this constant 70% of their capacity. Is it really called fart leg if they don't opt to go up into those higher intensities? Probably not. And that middle one there, yes, we've just said it's great to be varied, there's lots of changes inside of it to keep it exciting, but that level of variation and difficulty to predict it makes it harder to, to, to observe progress. Now, what if someone goes a little bit faster up a hill one week, a little bit slower up the hill next week, but their overall time got better? Well, why did it get better? Because of the hill running capabilities going up? or their sprint speed when they were going back down the other side? Or did they just get better at running on a woodland rather than road? So it's difficult to see where progress is being made because there's so many different variables at play. And interval training. So as you can see from that picture, we've got that slow period and fast period, or rest period and work period. Now we can, you know, the absolute extremes is that we work at 100% when we're working and we rest at 100% and we go completely to, to nothing. So all, all in, all on, or completely off. Now we can increase rest or decrease work accordingly. So it doesn't have to be all on or all off. It can be a combination of the two. But as long as we've set them. As long as we can say how long each one is going to last, at what level each one is going to be set. 100% intensity, 70% intensity, or is it going to be 60%, 40%, 60%, 40%. As long as we've set them and planned them, that's interval training. Because what we can then start to do is, pulling theory from weight training now, is use reps and sets. How many repetitions of Work, rest, work, rest, work, rest, are you going to complete in a row? How many to make up the set? How many of those working sets are you going to produce? So it's this playing around with the work and the rest periods, but we need to plan them, design them, this thought that goes into them before the performer then executes. And just like with continuous and fire leg training, it's suited for those repetitive movement actions, running, cycling, swimming, rowing, where we can switch on, we go maximal, and then we completely rest. 
So, some pros. We can target a wide range of components for fitness. How? Well, because we can play around with the intensities. If we go closer to 100%, speed, strength, power. The lower that work intensity gets, aerobic endurance, muscular endurance. Very little equipment, just like continuous and fart leg. If we're using those running, swimming, rowing, cycling contexts, it doesn't require too much in the way of equipment. Perhaps, well, not so much for the rowing and cycling, like we've already said, but walking, running, swimming, very accessible, very cost effective. And then down at the bottom there, the data, easier to track, especially compared to Fartlek, because it's pre planned. We're setting the times, the distances, the intensities, we're writing them down so that we could take that workout and do it again, and we can check progress. So it's quite easy to see the progress and then make it harder to add in that progressive overload. The downside of those is that top one there. It requires extensive planning. It requires a lot of thought. It requires a lot of preparation. And we, to, 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 um, to track and to log performance over and over again, that's, that takes a lot of discipline. You know, fartlek, Grab your shoes, grab your bike, go out. If you're feeling motivated, work a little bit harder. If you're not feeling motivated, work a little bit easier. We're not going to assess progress because it's too hard to do. Whereas interval training, because we've got the data, it's going to take that time and effort and energy to go through the paperwork to ascertain if progress has been made, what needs to be changed for next time. And then that last point there, especially if we are focusing on strength, speed, agility, things like that, and we're working above that 85% towards that 100% intensity, it takes a lot of drive and motivation to reach there. So if we haven't got a motivated performer, they're less likely to achieve the, that higher training intensity zone, and they're not going to get those benefits which the training session is designed for. And if the training session doesn't get the benefits or it doesn't make the progress that it's designed for, can we really say it's an effective training method? Probably not for this person. Which brings us to the end. So that was uh, training types. Hopefully now you are a little bit more clued up on the different characteristics of each and you know some advantages and disadvantages for performers or coaches to consider before they design and include them in a, in a training regime. So either underneath this video or in the portal wherever you're uh, tuning in to watch this group class, uh, access the, the worksheets um, and the templates for you to use to, you know, to really secure your knowledge now, to you know, get those key points written down, to go back through um, or go back through this PowerPoint to really uh, nail down all of the information that we've discussed today. So I hope that uh, was of help. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about where to find uh, these lessons or the resource sheets that go with it or other videos and um, revision like this, head over to uh, thepetutor.com where we've got one-to-one -one group classes, resources, YouTube channel, all sorts going on. But yeah, thepetutor.com is where to go. So I hope that was good. Great to deliver it. And yeah, hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.